Hey YouTube. Hey Brad, that's Brad of Full Spectrum Survival. So the unthinkable's happened, we've gone to war, there's been a nuclear exchange and you haven't died. And you're in your shelter that you've improvised, or your expensive luxury nuclear bunker that you bought because you're very, very wealthy. And you're thinking about, what am I going to do next? Over-the-counter precautions that you can take to lower your radiation count in the event of a nuclear war or a nuclear accident. Hopefully we won't be having a nuclear war anytime soon, but you never know. These are my meds. This one is specific for radiation, but there is overlap in all three boxes and I have antibiotics and all the rest of the stuff that you'd expect as a prepper to keep for our problems. But we're not going to go into them, we're going to go into this. When you open this, what you find is uh, two pieces of information straight off. It's uh, what's in the box, what's not in the box and how to use it. This one is a handy dandy thing, it's in the description, it gives you a whole bunch of different medications and it tells you how to dose them and what to use them for. Parts of this will also be selectively put up during the presentation. None of these medications should be taken unless you are eating and drinking outside. Some of them need to be taken before you start that process, about a day or two beforehand. What you are effectively trying to do is block the uptake of radioactive isotopes from the food and drink into your body, into certain organs of your body, and having taken them on board, because you're going to, you want to get them out of your body as fast as you can. Remember the three golden rules. Time, the longer the time you spend in contact with radioactive material, the higher your cancer rate. The further away those materials are, the lower your cancer rate. The more material between you and radioactive materials, the lower your cancer rate. Vitamin D. You're going to be sheltering in place. You're going to be hiding from sunlight for quite some time. And then when you emerge from shelter, you probably won't be getting that much sunlight anyway due to the people and cities that are in the atmosphere blocking sun. Barium sulfate. Barium sulfate comes in little plastic containers and what it does is it blocks strontium. If you have it, you want to give 300 milligrams once for one day. It will cause severe constipation. Try to get this, I just really could not get it. Uh, Prussian blue. You can get Prussian blue paint quite easily, but I didn't really want to take paint as a thing in a radiation emergency because I can actually substitute other stuff in. If I could get Prussian blue, I would actually get it. And I'm kind of annoyed because when I was doing chemistry when I was 14, there was a ton of it in the lab. Anyway, so if you have Prussian blue, give three grams of it once a day for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, if they still have symptoms of radiation poisoning, Keep giving it until you run out. Metamucil for constipation. You're looking for fibre and not anything to irritate the bowel, but just plain bulky fibre. A vegan, don't really have a problem with that. If you start taking the stuff in here, I'm going to have a huge problem with it. If you're not a vegan and you start taking the stuff in here, you're going to be bunged up real quick. And Metamucil actually will work with some of these medications to actually increase the removal of radioactive isotopes from within the body. The other thing I wanted to get and I haven't got in this box is calcium phosphate powder. If you have calcium phosphate powder that's safe for humans to eat, you want to take 1.2 grams of it or 1,200 milligrams of it once a day. It will help you excrete radioactive radium isotopes and strontium isotopes from throughout your body. I get this for sure, calcium carbonate. Um, you want to take approximately 1 to 2 grams a day for about 30 days, continue onwards if you still have radiation poison symptoms that are severe, and this will reduce radium and it will reduce sontium. If you have a hard time getting this, remember I got this from Costco Cheap, it also has vitamin D, which is a really useful thing to have in a nuclear situation. Try looking for Tums. Always read the labels. This is actually calcium carbonate, and each tablet is a gram. So what I'm looking for here is two of these a day for 30 days. Now I have enough for this to do that easily. The other thing you're going to get when you open this box, because remember I might not be here, is from this organisation in Ontario, Canada, which I believe still will send you free uh, potassium iodide tablets. There's a whole bunch of information on this. What's the number one medication you should have? Yeah, this. This is potassium iodide. You would take this 24 to 36 hours before you start eating and drinking water that's contaminated. You do not ever take this if you are eating and drinking water and food stuff so that's not contaminated. For example, if you are breastfeeding, you would take this 24 to 36 hours beforehand if you were actually going to eat and drink contaminated fluids, and you would also give this to the baby who's breastfeeding. However, if your baby is using pre-explosion water and pre-explosion milks from powder, there's absolutely no need for the baby to take this. You've probably seen this as well. I strongly advise you get it. If you're under the age of 40 and a nuclear accident or nuclear bombs go off, you absolutely need this. This will selectively uptake this iodine in your thyroid gland 
Thyroid cancers are deadly. They happen months to years after exposure. The younger you are when you're exposed, the more likely you are to get it early and to die from it. So 70 year old people really kind of don't need this. People around about my age will hurt me and people younger really need it. It's critical. Remember if you're allergic to iodide, don't take this. It could kill you easily. Selective anti-diarrheal medications with some Nicorette and also some of my own medications in here for blood pressure. One of the things I'm happy about is about four weeks ago I quit Nicorette after a decade so I don't need it. But if you're going to stop this because you'd use nicotine, get the 21 milligrams, the step one, and what you do is you cut it into quarters and use a quarter a day. You're going to have bad cravings but at least it's going to help temper some of the nicotine withdrawal. And people will have nicotine withdrawal, they'll have it bad. Anti-nausea meds. Why? Controversial. First off, you've got acute radiation poisoning, you're going to poop your brains out. Anything that can slow that process down might make it more comfortable to nurse that person as they probably are going to die anyway. As an RN, and Kitty is an RN, I feel comfortable using this for nausea from mild radiation poisoning. Radiation poisoning comes quite quickly, feels really bad, and then it goes away. It has a bit of a latency period for a few days where you feel not so bad, and then you get really sick. So bear in mind, be careful what you do with anti-nausea, anti-diarrhea medications, but you really want to have them available for symptom relief, not necessarily for cure. Third most critical medication that you can get would be Gaviscon. Again, a lot of you guys and girls are using it right now because you have indigestion. That's a sign your diet's bad and you need to fix it. But specifically, why do I want Gaviscon? Well, I want an antacid, but I don't want any antacid. But I want an antacid that contains an ingredient that's no longer popular because of Alzheimer's links. So they say, and it probably is true, aluminium hydroxide. This contains aluminium hydroxide. I had to search the webs to get it one with that in. Why do I want this? Well, within 24 hours of ingesting certain radioactive materials, if I take enough of this, I will help remove most of it from my body. For an adult, you want to take 120 milligrams, 1.2 grams. This works out with this one, because you have to look at the dosing of each one of them, to be 60 to 100 mils of Gaviscon. It is thankfully a one-off dose, but you should feel free to repeat any of these one-off doses if a several weeks or a month or two has gone by and you feel you've been recontaminated. If you've got children, you want to give 50 milligrams per kilogram. So if they weigh 10 kilograms, again, you can have to figure out metric when the apocalypse happens, Americans, you really should. You're going to give 500 milligrams of this. Now, what I would point out to you is if your child is really, really fat, you wouldn't give more than the adult dose of 1.2 grams. For an adult, this would be 10 doses. For major contamination, I've seen it recommended to give 2.5 grams, 2,500 milligrams, once a day for five days. Now, whether you can actually drink that and stomach that with severe radiation poisoning, I have no idea, but that's just there in case you have enough Gaviscon, aluminium hydroxide only, because it could be anything. Milk of magnesium is magnesium. You don't want to use that. You need aluminium hydroxide. N95 masks. Three reasons why you want these. If people have actually got radiation poisoning, their immune system is compromised. So if you're able to nurse them and you don't feel that bad, you don't want to necessarily breathe germs into them because they will actually not be able to fight them off. It's called reverse barrier nursing. It's a technique and a skill that you might, might want to look at in this particular case. The other reason, of course, is you don't want to inhale dust that's radioactive yourself, so they're always a good thing to have. Reducing input is actually better than trying to get rid of it. But there's a third ghastlier reason for this, that I stock a lot of these for nuclear war specifically, and that's biological weapons. Russia has them, America has them, China has them, pretty sure Britain has them. They will be released in a full-on nuclear war. I'm sure of it. Notepad and pencil. Always a good idea. You can communicate secretly using notes, but also you want to keep track of what you're giving and why you're giving it. If anybody ever calls you on it, this will be very helpful. If you can do respiration and blood pressure and other information like do they feel hot, are they pooping blood, etc. It's a good record. It'll give you something to do. It makes it look more official when you are actually treating your family and pets. The rad block, isostat. If you keep this dry and away from sunlight, it will last probably forever. The younger you are, the more likely you are to get cancer here and most likely will be terminal. Anybody under the age of 30 to 40, anybody, should absolutely be taking this in the event of a nuclear war or a nuclear accident. They should take it a couple of days before they're going to be eating and drinking and they need to keep it going for a week to two weeks. If there's a further bomb or a further release down the line after the two-week period, they should repeat the course. Now, it is iodine, so if you're allergic to shellfish, this could kill you. 
There is a table here and you'll notice I say note grind up tablets for infants. This is American so it's talking about iodine liquid and iodine liquid works just as well. But inside here there is actually information that you might want which actually tells you what to do. And I definitely will put this up now as a picture and you can see that you can actually grind the tablets of an addict with a bit of milk or water for very tiny infants. Absolutely critical children get this and infants get this. Absolutely critical. Only give any of this stuff if you can't get medical advice and there's been a release of radiation. What else is in the box is a little bit of linocaine. I'm anticipating burns so this can go directly on the burn. It can cause cardiac issues so be careful but if you burn like a crisp you might want this especially if it's a flash burn only on part of your face. This will help the pain. I do of course have burns kits. I don't really think these are worth it but I actually got this kind of discount bin so I bought it. These are rehydration salts you can make your own out of salt and sugar and you should know how to do that but always have more than you need. These will last forever. Pectin powder, pectin tablets. This is kind of arguable. There's a whole bunch of research on this done from one guy once in uh, the post Chernobyl area of Ukraine and Belarus and it probably works. It does bind and it will help you out. So you should have this and it's pretty easy to get, pretty cheap to get and pretty safe to use. So I would suggest you use pectin and a little bread. So what happens after that fact or for people who have gotten caught outside? What happens for them? For them, apple juice. Why apple juice? That seems like a relatively uh, uh, non-consequential item to have for a nuclear disaster. During the Chernobyl incident, in which there was uh, cesium-137, was uh, some children were inundated with it. 17 years after the Chernobyl incident, uh, the nuclear power accident that happened at Chernobyl, most of the radio contaminated among the populace were children. Uh, the varying levels of 137C, so cesium-137, absorbed among children in this area was explained by their food source. So they were continuing to eat things that had radiation in them, especially milk. Milk is a big, uh, you know, the animals pick up the radiation or they have it inside them. It transfers to the milk glands and they're given to children, human children. So what did they do? They gave them apple juice, just apple juice. The pectin inside of apple juice binds to cesium-137 pulls it into your intestines and lets you pass it through your urine. Apple juice can save your life. Why should you have it? Because you need it. You have to have a solution. What happens when you run out of potassium iodide pills? What happens if you're already exposed or your family is? You have to find a way to pull that out of your system. Better night clay. Half to one tablespoon a day forever. That's what the hippies use. But for me, and it's hard to find it, what I would recommend you take in a nuclear emergency if you're trying to decontaminate yourself because you've actually already ingested heavy metals and radioactive material, is one to two tablespoons a day for seven days. Now I'd recommend, because I think it's a great idea, uh, mixing it in vegan chocolate. And apparently they tried this with cows and they dropped the radiation in the milk by 50%. Now I don't know why they're giving vegan chocolate to cows and I can't find the study, so I just have to take my word on it. I think this won't harm you too much, except it will give you massive and severe constipation. So make sure you have a ton of metamucil, and I'm not kidding. If you're going to drink this without vegan chocolate, what you want to do is mix it in about 8 ounces of water and then repeat another 8 ounces and preferably another 8 ounces after that. You're going to get really constipated if you start using this, but it might work. The other thing I have is one of these. This is actually a radiation dose meter, and it's a single use. I'm not really keen on dosing. Um, because in a nuclear war, dosing continues onwards and onwards and you limit the amount of dose you get or you die and if you can't limit it, you die. Instructions and the paper. So these are pretty expensive and I suspect they're really expensive now with what's going on in the world. I'm not really sure you need one. I do have a Geiger counter. I would probably open this and use this if I was in a prepared bunker area for a period of time so we could see approximately what the dosing was during the time in the bunker. Baking soda, humble baking soda. You're going to eat this, make absolutely sure you get pure baking soda. If it says natural or whatever, who cares? You want to look at the, re the ingredients list, it has to have zero additives, so you could really harm yourself here. You want to take one tablespoon of this a day for seven days. This has an effect on a type of radioactive material that hasn't been affected by everything else we've done. It decreases the uranium isotopes in the human body. It does it by helping them excrete by the bladder in your urine. This means that your urine is going to be very, very radioactive, so bear that in mind. This stuff is recommended IV. 
most people won't be able to give this IV. And I can tell you right now, as a retired critical care nurse, giving intravenous sodium bicarbonate or sodium bicarb to anybody is really, really, really dangerous. And it's not something I recommend you do that unless you have a full and functional ICU at your capacity and you can take blood gases very frequently. You won't have the ability to do that even if you are Elon Musk in a nuclear war. So that's it. I hope you never need this video. In addition to all of this stuff, what you should also have is vitamins A and vitamin C. It's always helpful. Omega-3 fish oils might help also protect you in a radiation event. Pectin is, I say, a query. I'm not absolutely convinced it will work very well, but I don't think it's a harmful thing to do. And if worst case you just stock a lot of apple juice, that's a good thing. What they have found that did work post Chernobyl was strawberries, blueberries, kale and spinach. So make sure you have plenty of them. And obviously you won't be harvesting them outside because they're going to be very radioactive for a period of time. But you actually might want to look at getting dried versions of these and storing them up in advance. They'll never be as effective uh, for the antioxidant removal and the radical removal as the fresh stuff, but it'll help a bit. Hope you enjoyed this. Toodles. Isn't it an absolutely wonderful day? Spring is coming. It's actually still just below freezing here, but we've had a couple of days of thaw, and so most of the snow is starting to go. So I'm looking forward to getting back to doing some yard work. And that was an unscripted moment where I smelted underneath the tripod. Bye. So, <coughs> hey, what's that? Part two. Oh. Should be working, I shouldn't be doing this.